2023. You know, when, you're, when you've got grown children and they have children, it seems like, I don't know if this has happened to some of you, but your children like to remind you how old you are. <laughs> and one of the ways one of my sons did, I won't mention which one, when, when they were uh, starting the construction on the bridge, remember back in the 40s when they first started the construction on <laughs> this new bridge? One of my sons says, Dad, you're a three-bridger. I go, what? He goes, weren't you around when the first bridge was with the, with the, when it opened up? I go, yeah, as a little kid. He said, then you went over the second bridge. He goes, now you're a three-bridger. And I go, so basically you're saying I'm old, right? He goes, yeah, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> and, and speaking of the bridge, I'm not going to say anything about the bridge, except that it, it would, you think 2023 it'll happen? I mean... <laughs> Unless the barges hit it or something. But driving over that bridge now as a three-bridger, um, it's always been interesting to me because it's, it's 13 miles long and about three miles wide. And the very first time I went to Israel, I, I looked at the Sea of Galilee, and it reminded me so much of Pensacola Bay because it is 13 miles long, but about... Well, it's, it's a little bit uh, eight miles wide, but it's similar in size and in shape. And, and I was always like, I'd see the Sea of Galilee and go, wow, it reminds me of the Pensacola Bay. And, and the disciples, they don't have a bridge, but they went back and forth across it many times. And, and if you have a Bible, t- turn with me to, to Luke chapter 8, where we have a story of the disciples going across this sea. It's really, it's really a lake. They call it Lake Gennesaret, Lake, lake Kinsret. They call it the Sea of Galilee. But it's really just a, a small bay like the Bay of Pensacola. It's beautiful. They, 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 they were kind of headquartered right on the Sea of Galilee as they were there in Capernaum. If you ever go to Israel, you go to Capernaum, and you can see where... Peter lived, the synagogue where Jesus healed the man with the withered hand, and it's right there on the shoreline of the Sea of Galilee. But the story I want you to look at begins in verse 22. It says, it happened on a certain day. He, speaking of Jesus, got into a boat with his disciples, and he said to them, let's cross over to the other side of the lake. The lake, because that's really what it is. It's just a big lake. And they would follow Jesus anywhere. Wherever he said to go, they went. So he's in the boat. He says, let's go to the other side. And they launched out. But as they sailed, he fell asleep. And a windstorm came down on the lake. And they were filling with water and were in jeopardy. A windstorm came down on the lake because... The, the Sea of Galilee is surrounded by these hills, these, these uh, mountains, if you will. They're not really mountains as much as they are large hills, and they have valleys. And when a storm would hit, it would come through, the wind would come through those valleys. It would kind of be pressurized because it's such narrow, and it would hit this lake, and it would just kind of erupt into waves and chop. And so they're out there with Jesus. He's asleep. And they came to him and awoke him. Master, master, we're perishing. He arose and rebuked the wind and the raging of the water, and they ceased, and they were calm. And he said, where's your faith? And they said, we were afraid. And they marveled, saying to one another, who who can this be? For he commands even the winds and the water, and they obey him. They feared for their lives. They woke Jesus up. And then they were more frightened, I think, about Jesus than they were the storm. It was kind of like, Lord, Lord, we're going to die. We're going to drown. Uh, don't you care? And, and I think many people have said this. Perhaps you've said it yourself at times when going through a storm or a trial or a difficulty. God, don't you care? 
Don't you care what I'm going through? Don't you care about what's happening to me? This is certainly the case with these guys. I mean, they would follow Jesus anywhere. They trusted in him. They believed in him. But they still ask him, don't you care? I mean, in the midst of the storm, Jesus reveals to them in another way, a more powerful way, who he really is. They, they, they knew him in a lot of ways, but they'd never seen him like this. They knew him as a healer. They'd seen him heal miraculously. They knew him as a teacher, and, and, and some of them would record his teachings and say, boy, he, he taught like no one ever taught with great authority. And the crowds would be massive at times. They knew him even as a prophet, a miracle worker. They even agreed and believed that he was a long-awaited Messiah. But now something shifts for them. They're in this little boat, just, just the 12 and Jesus, and, and they're astounded. And they say, who is this that even the wind and the waves obey him? If you look back in this, this it, it says, he says to them, where is your faith? And they marveled to one another in verse 25. Who can this be? What do you mean, who can this be? You've been following him now for quite some time. Well, who, who can this be that, that even the wind and the waves obey him? I mean, they're, they're, they're astounded. They're basically asking the question, who, who, is, who is this that's in the boat with us that can do this? What kind of power does he have? See, see, listen, let me have your attention for a second. Do you know who you're following? Do you know who you're trusting? Do you know who you've kind of climbed into the boat with? The one who loves you and cares for you, who gave himself for you on the cross to, to redeem you? He's amazing in love, but also in power. Amazing who he is. And sometimes he will allow things into your life to reveal more of who he is to you. And sometimes it comes in the form of a storm, a difficulty, a trial. And, and it comes to, to, to reveal and to stabilize and to concretize and define for you more who he is, who you're following, and who you can trust. Yes. See, as we enter into 2023... And if you go through a trial or a storm, a difficulty, it's not because Jesus doesn't care. It's not because he's apathetic or asleep or not aware or weak. He's certainly not that. It, it might be that he's wanting to give you a fresh look at who he is at his power, at his desire to strengthen your faith. And, and sometimes when things don't go our way or as we planned or something happens out of the ordinary, we think, God, don't you care? And Jesus, in the Gospel of John, I'll, I'll just read it for you. In chapter 14, he's, he's about to go away. And you, you know this, this passage. It's, it's very familiar. He tells his disciples, no, let not your heart be troubled. And my father's house are, are many dwelling places. I go to prepare one for you. He's going away. And he said, where I am, there you will be also, and where I go, and the way you know. And Thomas speaks up and goes, Lord, we don't know where you're going. So how, how can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, he looked at Thomas and says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And, and no one comes to the father except through me. If you had known me, you would also have known my father, and from now on you know him and have seen him. And then Philip speaks up. First Thomas, now Philip. And says, Lord, show us the father. That would be, that'd be sufficient for us. And Jesus answered, have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? What a question. In this, this, this context of Jesus telling them, I'm going away, and the questions start popping up, he had already told, told Peter that he would deny him three times. Peter goes, not going to happen. He makes this amazing statement, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Philip speaks up after Thomas said, well, just show us the Father. 
And Jesus says, have I been with you so long that you don't know who I am? Don't you trust me, Philip? And, and, and in the midst of this storm they're going through right now, this storm of Jesus leaving, which is huge for them because they followed him and left everything. And now he says he's leaving. I, I think about Moses, a fugitive in the desert for 40 years. I'm sure there must have been times when Moses was sitting out in the desert watching these sheep, saying stuff like, God, don't you care? Don't you care that I'm out here? You, you rescued me as an infant. You, you had me in, in the, the palace of the greatest king of Egypt, the Pharaoh, and, and now look at me. Lord, don't you care? And God was preparing. God was rebuilding. God was going to send Moses at 80 years old back to Egypt. And he was going to deliver Israel in a powerful way. God, don't you care? Yeah, I do, but you don't kind of know what I'm doing right now. I'm sure Moses was confused. Daniel thrown into the lion's den. I'm sure as they were getting ready to toss him in there, something must have gone through his heart like, Lord, don't you care? <laughs> I'm about to be eaten by those stinking lions down there. And not a one touched him. Shadrach, Meshach. And as my, my, my friend Fidel Gomez used to say, Shadrach, Meshach, and one bad amigo were thrown in a fiery furnace. And it says their, their clothes didn't even smell like smoke. And I'm sure as they're about to be tossed in the fire, God, don't you care? Yeah, he does. Adam hiding after being thrown out of the, the garden. You know, now the relationship... I thought we were just about to be raptured or something. <laughs> that wasn't planned. God, don't you care? <laughs> okay, where was I? Oh, yeah, Adam. Thrown out of the garden. Ashamed. I'm sure feeling like the biggest failure ever, shifting blame here and there, must have said sometime in his heart, God, don't you still care about me? And God comes looking for him. Adam's hiding. And I think all of us in some way hide from God sometimes. God says, yeah, I'm care. Where, where are you, Adam? He calls him out. And sometimes, and this is, this is the story here in the storm and these different experiences, sometimes there's more going on than we see, more than we know. Certainly was with Daniel and certainly was with Paul when he was shipwrecked and beaten and, and God would use him in a powerful way. It's like this story in the Gospel of Luke. There's more going on in the story than they realize. See, see, go back with me to, to Luke again, back there in the eighth chapter, Be, because the story goes on. In verse 26, after this storm on the sea, they, they sailed to the country of the Gadarenes, which is the opposite side. This was about a five-mile journey from where they were to the Gadarene side. I've been there several times. It's, it's, it's a little five-mile journey across the lake there. And, and when he stepped out on the land, Jesus, there met him a certain man from the city who had demons for a long time. It's not a, not a simple situation. And he wore no clothes, nor did he live in a house, but he lived among the tombs. And many times the tombs in those days were were caves, or, or sometimes they were built up tombs, and he must have lived in those tombs, in those caves, with the bones or the remains of those who've been buried there. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him, and with a loud voice said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High? I beg you, do not torment me. For he commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man, for it often seized him, and he was kept under guard, bound with chains and shackles, and he broke the bonds and was driven by the demon into the wilderness. And Jesus said to him, what is your name? 
And he said, Legion, because he had many demons, and they had entered him. Mark tells us, and I'll just read it real, real quickly. He has a similar description. They came to the other side, Mark 5, verse 1, of the sea to the country of the Gadaran. And when he had come out of him, the boat immediately, when he came out of the boat, immediately there met him one of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit. Now, I want you to get this picture in your mind. They've come out of this storm. They, they just found out that Jesus has power to, to stop wind and waves and calm the sea. And they, they, they come up on the shore of the Gadarene, and out of a tomb comes a naked man, scarred, shackles, probably no chains, but on him, and, he, and he's, he's, he's demon-possessed. He has dwelling among them, and no one could bind him, not even with chains. This is an, an, a very interesting uh, situation here that's, that's going on with, with this man. And the chains have been pulled apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces, and neither could anyone tame this guy. And, and always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying out and cutting himself. He was a cutter way back then. And Mark tells us this story. It's similar to the story that Luke shares. And so here's the scene. Jesus comes ashore. And living among the tombs with broken shackles and cuts over his body, uh, screaming, demon-possessed, the storm had subsided on the lake. The wind had stopped, the waves had calmed. Disciples are still somewhat in shock and amazement of who's in the boat with them. And they pull up on the shore, and the storm was just a preview. Here's the main attraction. It's this man. See, that's why Jesus said, hey, let's get in the boat. We're going to the other side. Jesus had, a, had an appointment with this, this demoniac who had been a long time in this situation. And he had just revealed to his men that he had the power not only to, to calm, you know, wind and waves and storms, but they, they pull up and they see this. A raving, howling, demonic, naked, scarred man living among the tombs. And I'm sure the disciples probably stayed behind Jesus. I would have. Like, Lord, we'll watch the boat for a while. <laughs> Needs a little repair after the storm. I'm sure they were freaked out when they saw this man. But I don't think Jesus was. Now, Jesus sees people a lot differently than you and I do. I think when Jesus sees a homeless man, a, an alcoholic, or whatever, he sees him a lot different than you and I see him. He sees someone that's created in the image of God, someone who's broken, who had a family he grew up in, had a future. When Jesus sees a prostitute or a drug addict or someone who's suicidal without hope, he, he looks at him a lot differently, I think, than you and I look at him. Sometimes we have, we're quick to judge. Why don't they just get a job? Or why don't they just straighten up? He sees the impact of choices, the torment of the enemy, the, the failures and the hurts. He, he sees a man, this man, who, who comes out of this tomb, who's naked and scarred and, and his life is a mess. He sees a man created in the image of God. And he's hurting. Far away from what he or she was ever created to be or do, he looks at this man. I think when Jesus looked at this demoniac, he saw someone's son, someone's child, someone who had a mother and a father. But we don't know the whole story. Somewhere, somehow, at some time in his life, he, he opened himself up to some kind of evil. Maybe it was through pagan worship. You know, in, in Roman days, which this would have been that time, uh, th there was the god Bacchus that many would worship. It was the god of drink. Maybe he wor worshiped Bacchus and drank all the time and opened himself up. 
Maybe he was into some kind of witchcraft, which, which is the word pharmakia, which we, we, we get our word drugs from these days. Maybe he was involved in witchcraft and opened himself up to a realm of influence that God didn't desire. Sort of the dark side of life. Somewhere, it seems, at some time, this man stepped beyond the boundaries of God's will and must have thought, hey, this is pleasurable. This is what I enjoy. This is good. This is exciting. And he started making choices that led him, well, led him where he is now. The Bible does say that the involvement in sin is pleasurable for season, but it has a price tag. And, and, and it also says that the enemy has come to kill, to steal, and destroy who you are and what you have. And so this man, somewhere in his life, began going down that path, and the enemy began to steal and began to kill and to destroy and take everything from him and stuffed him into a tomb and left him there full of demons. And Jesus is making his way, that five-mile trek through the storm and showing his disciples at the same time, hey, I got this. I'm more than you even think I am. And there's consequences to choices, a bill to pay. Ask people who are imprisoned or on death row. People living with broken marriages or lost hope or estranged children. Well, there's consequences to things you do, to things you say, the, the, the things you involve yourself in. Yeah, it may be pleasurable for a season. The Bible says it is. And here in Luke's gospel, we have this man who is now possessed by demons, controlled by evil, unsafe, unwanted. He's completely isolated and put away, chained, shackled. That in ancient times would, would be, you know, the, the asylum, the prison, the institution. Hey, there's nothing more we can do with him. Just chain him up out there by the tombs. Family, friends, community, they, they, they probably tried everything. But here he is now. He's, he's put away. He's cast out. He's, he's in desperation He's given over to being inhabited by demons. And someone, you might be here today and say, ooh, demons. That's not real. Well, to that, I would say, wake up. Amen. It is real. We all have a spiritual enemy who's come to kill, steal, and destroy. What do you think is behind all the evil and the senseless killing and the shootings and all the violence that's going on and all the evil that happens in our world? So Jesus sees this person, and he's coming at him. And the disciples are probably saying, Lord, the boat's ready now. We can leave. Storm subsided. But, but here in our, in our text, we, we have a, a passage here in Luke. Jesus asked him a question. What's your name? He, he's looking for a response. And, and I think and commentators have different opinions of this, but I think he's speaking to the man, not the, not, the, not the demons. I think Jesus is trying to reach in there and find him. What's your name? What's your story? Who are you? How'd you get here? The, the, the Lord ever ask you that? They started asking me that when I was about 18 years of age. What's your name? Who are you? What do you want to do with your life? Where are you at right now? Where, where are you hoping to go? Je Jesus is speaking to this man, and, and it, like he would always ask questions of people, like the woman at the well, hey, could you give me a drink? What about your marriages? Go get your husband. He asks a man, who, who, who are you? What, what do you? But he doesn't respond. I mean, look what happens. There's a response. They said, Legion, the demons speak up. 
And they begged him that he would not command them to go out into the abyss. And there was a herd of swine was feeding there on the mountain, so they begged him. He would permit them to enter them, and he permitted them. Now, this is a whole other theological debate about these swine and demons and all of that. We, we don't have time to go down that road. The demons went out of the man, entered the swine, and the, he, the herd ran violently down the steep place and to the lake, and, and they were drowned. They acknowledged Jesus, the, the demons did, his authority, his, his, his power, and they make a request. It's amazing. They recognize who Jesus was more so than the disciples did who had been with him all that time. They realized he had power and authority. And Jesus grants their request. That's, that's, what's, that's an interesting point to me that, that the demons ask for something. Jesus says, okay, I'll give it to you. And, and when those who fed them, fed the swine, saw what had happened, verse 34, they fled and told it to the city and in the country. They, 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 they must have been nearby that herd, and they saw it. They went back to town and told everybody what was going down. And the whole multitude, verse 37 of, of Luke chapter 8, the whole town comes out, it seems like. I, I bet they did. They all knew about this guy. And here's what they asked Jesus. Hey, can you heal, heal my son? Can you heal my... No, they say, we want you to depart. For they were seized with great fear. And he got into the boat. And that now the man, verse 38, from whom the demons departed, begged him that he might be with him, but Jesus sent him away. This is interesting to me. The demons asked, hey, would you do something for us? Don't send us to the abyss. Apparently, that's a pretty bad place to go. He says, okay, I'll send you to the swine. The people asked, would you leave? He goes, okay, I'll leave. And then we have in this text something interesting. Now, the man from whom demons had departed begged that he might be with him, with Jesus, but Jesus sent him away. What, you, you gave the demons what they wanted? And the people who wanted nothing to do, you, you gave them what they wanted? But the man whom you just restored, you say no to him? Doesn't it sometimes seem to you like, wow, you know, the enemy does his thing. And we look at it and go, well, Lord, what about me? Jesus is not confused or off course because of the storm. He, he's pretty much on track, I think, right where he's supposed to be. He, he comes to a, to a man who's imprisoned, a man who's tormented, who's isolated, who's hopeless, to restore him. But, but I want you to hear this part too. But not just to restore him. Not just to deliver him from the evil, not just to, to, to give him a, a, a second chance. But listen what he says to him. You return to your own house and you tell what great things God has done for you. And he went his way. And he proclaimed throughout the whole city what great things Jesus had done for him. Amen. Isn't that powerful? Amen. Lord, can I go with you? Can I get in the boat with you and the guys? No, you can't. I want you to go home. Lord, you don't understand. I can't go home. They don't want to see me there. No, I want you to go home. I want you to go home changed. I want you to go home different. And you know what? That's what should happen to us. Not, not only should we be impacted by his power and his authority and his, his, his ability to change us completely as we step into his presence day by day, week by week. We're not told what happened when he goes home. I bet it was interesting. 
I mean, did he leave home as a teenager? Was, was he a prodigal from the Jewish faith? I, I don't know. Did he shame his parents and his family that, that they, they, you know, they had to walk around town with their head down? Like, you know, there, there's the couple whose son's out by the tombs who lives among the swine and demons. There. Yeah, that's their son. I don't know. Was he married when he left? Uh, it'd be interesting if he was married and had a family and then he got, you know, pulled into all this and, and, and he knocks on the door. Honey, I'm home. I'm clothed. I'm in my right mind. Is there a reunion? Did, did she lock the door and say, no, you go away. You've been gone a long time. Honey, I've changed. I met Jesus. As we step into to this new year, listen, maybe you struggle with the God of Bacchus, alcohol. Or maybe your God is money, it's greed, I got to get more and more and more. Maybe it's just pride. Maybe it's drugs or sexual addiction. Let me say this, it's nothing compared to this guy. Nothing. If he can send him away changed, he can certainly do that for you. Right? If he can take him out of that storm and out of that imprisonment and out of that desperate situation. Otherwise, there's no reason to read this story. That's why it's there. That's why we got this story in the Bible. He can help rebuild relationships, restore with children, with parents, re, with friends. He, he says, I want you to go back home. Tell them about me, that Jesus saves, that he changes, that he delivers lives, that he gives hope. See, here's what Jesus does. Not only does he change people, but he gives them a message and a purpose. And I want you to remember as we step into a new year, not only is it about knowing him and following him, but it's also about having a mission and a purpose for him. Tell your friends, tell your family, tell your neighbors that he delivers and that he gives hope, that he offers life, not isolation. Freedom, not chains. See, Jesus offers home, not loneliness. So I want you to go home. If anyone be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things pass away. Behold, all things become new. There are those who enjoyed the swine, the pleasure, the money, the ego, and they send Jesus away. I'd, I'd rather make money. I'd, I'd rather, you know, you get out of here, Jesus, and let me get back to what I was doing, back to my profession, back to my money, back to my business, back to my job, whatever it might be. Just go away. Uh, that must have shocked Jesus. I mean, what, what a testimony. Here's this man, you know, in his right mind, completely delivered. Everyone knew, especially those who kept the swine, there was right there. And, and they go, we don't want anything to do with you, Jesus. Get back in your boat. And I think there's a lot of people like that who see changed lives of friends and neighbors, parents, children, and yet they send him away in some, some way, ignore him. But there are those who, who, who know, who realize they need help. This man, I don't know who was controlling the situation, half man, half demon, whatever it was, but, but fell down before him and said, have mercy. And boy, he's set free and given wholeness. See, I, I would say in many ways, that's, that's your story, that's my story. And, and in 2023, 20, I would say that this is our mission. Return to your own house and tell what great things God has done for you. Amen. Listen to it again. Return to your own house. 
to, to your neighborhood, to your people, to, to wherever God's placed you, your workplace, your, your scenario, your, your issues, whatever, turn, return there and tell what great things God has done for you. And he went his way and proclaimed throughout the whole city what great things Jesus had done for him. Hey, if you do anything in 2023, I would say go home, go to your city, and don't be ashamed, don't be afraid to tell people what great things Jesus has done for you. That's our mission. That's our call. Not only to, to find ourselves restored and, and brought out of isolation, out of addiction, or whatever it might be, and then to realize, you know what? It's not just about me and Jesus. Not about, hey, I got my thing with Jesus. No, it's about Jesus saying, now you tell others what great things God has done for you. And he can take you through any kind of storm because he really does care. And God is faithful. Amen?